Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and once again I'm delighted to be joined by Mr David Lowe as well as Laura Bradburn. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, great to be back again and again. <laughs> David, I spoke to you yesterday and I think you've probably appeared on this more than anyone else apart from myself. So welcome mm. back for your sixth appearance. Thank um, you. Before we, we speak about some of the Celtic Trust uh, business and developments, David, last night was a wee bit positive, which was great watching Celtic winning a game, seeing Neil Lennon celebrating a, a brilliant winning goal by Turnbull. Does that offer a glimmer of hope on the, on the playing side of things, do you think? Well, yeah, it's one game, it's a bounce game with, with nothing at stake. But I, I didn't go home till late and I turned the telly on straight away. And I, I within 30 seconds, there was a, I, I noticed a change the pace, the determination of sorrow in particular, uh, and and others. So, yeah, I read a lot of positivity into it. I was actually shouting at the telly again, and, and I jumped up when uh, the winner went in. So there's nothing like Celtic victory to make you feel good again. It certainly did give quite a lot of people a, a wee bounce last night, David. I've seen uh, the comments coming into the bulletin after the game. And I, I think everybody went home in a good mood, which was brilliant. Now, Laura, yeah. we'll have a wee chat later about the game. But, you know, David, I'm very interested to see the progress of the Celtic Trust because we spoke back in August. At that point, there was a, there was a very specific reason for it. And you were, you were helping uh, shareholders to be reunited with um, their shares, of their certificates and, and various other things at that time. But there has been developments. So since August, what I'm going to ask you, first of all, is... I mean, did you see any of this coming? What what we are currently experiencing, this this downfall, this collapse of Celtic Football Club? Yeah, a, suddenly the work started in the background there. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, a, I can still or, hear you. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, listen, the, as soon as anybody expresses opinion on anything to do with Celtic, when the team's not doing well, it results in you know a whole lot of people having alternative views. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an exaggerated opinion, and you can't please everybody with your answer. But I'm going to give you my answer. I don't think anybody saw this coming, and I'll call it a collapse, a collapse in the, the team's results. I don't think anybody in the boardroom, any anybody amongst the support, or even anybody in the dressing room or on the management team saw this type of thing happening. You could argue that, you know, the team has slowly been deteriorating or not as uh, good as it was maybe 12 months ago. There's a debate to be had about that. But I defy anybody to say that Celtic would have won two games out of 12 or whatever the number is. So I'd say it was a shock for me. And the reaction has been huge and the reaction is understandable. And maybe the reaction is healthy. Because I, I think uh, Celtic were getting complacent. It was almost as if the 10 was our right. The 10 didn't have to be earned. We are bigger, richer, and more successful than any other team. Rangers are broke. It was almost as if we just had to turn up. And uh, I, I think we've all had a shock, and we all now realise that that's not the case. And uh, games have to be won, and the league has to be won. So there's a healthy aspect to this, but right now it feels horrible. And uh, I didn't see it coming is the answer to your question. Now, definitely, I think what happens as well, David, is as Celtic fans, I think, yeah, you can become complacent. Uh, the success is there, so it masks a lot of what's wrong behind the scenes at the club. We now start looking at the recruitment. We're looking at what's happening at the boardroom level. We're looking at the coaching staff and um, how fragmented that may or may not be. And obviously, any issues, any mutiny uh, in the camp uh, and amongst the players as well. Now, obviously, the Celtic Trust uh, looks at concerns with ownership of the club. What are your current concerns, David, with regards to the ownership of Celtic football? Club. A concern, yeah, no concern I'll do. Uh, so I think it should it's a concern that the ownership control of Celtic vests in two people. Dermot Desmond uh, and a guy called Nick Train who runs an investment firm in the city. Now there's nothing personal uh, against Dermot Desmond. Having a billionaire in your corner during a pandemic uh, is a good thing on balance. Uh, he's been there since 1994. He's a constant feature. 
it's, it's a very good thing to have somebody like that in your corner. So it's not a personal thing. It's just a matter of fact thing. It is not a healthy thing to have the control of the football club vested in the hands of two people, particularly when one of them is a financial investor with no emotional investment in Celtic. If the shares double, treble, or whatever, that guy sells his shares uh, and he's gone and he's made a profit and he's happy. Uh, he has no interest particularly in, in, in the, the ongoing future of the football club once he's attached these chips in. Again, that, that's his business. It's not an indictment or anything bad. His motivations are different. But basically, there is a possibility that if the price was right, we could wake up one morning and find out our control of the club has changed and we would have nothing to do to stop that. So that's not a good thing. And that's really why I got involved in the trust. You know, I've got this experience from the 1990s, you know, pre-Fergus McCann when the club was in a, a bad way. So I'm not saying we're in the same position now, but control is vested within the few. And it's, I'd say it's worse than that because over time, shareholders die. Over time, shareholders relocate. Mm -hmm. And that basically means because Celtic shareholders, they're basically, most of them will only ever own one share. It's an emotional investment. They're not familiar with the protocols, the procedures involved in uh, owning a share. You know, when you're moving house, you know, updating your share register with the club is not foremost in your mind. And, you know, when a family member with shares dies, you know, what happens to shares is not foremost in your mind. So over a prolonged period, which is over 25 years now, what has happened is that a significant number of shares are what you would call dead shares, untraceable shares, gone away shares. At the end of the day, you know what, there's shares that can't vote. And as the number of voting, non-voting shares, dead shares, what that does is uh, exacerbate or concentrate the control of the club in the hands of fewer and fewer uh, fans. So, for example, you know, Dermot Desmond being the largest shareholder, if he's got 30% of 100% of the shares, but 20% of the shares don't vote because they're going dead or missing, you know, that, that grip, that control rises. So that's not healthy. Nobody could say anything other than that. And, uh, you know, the Celtic Trust is engaged in a program of reactivating their shares. Uh, reunited, re reunited families uh, that inherited shares, uh, shareholders that are now updating their addresses. We're sorting that out, and there's a steady stream of shareholders that are getting reun reunited with their shares, reunited with their dividends. In some instance, instances, 23 years of dividends but crucially reunited with their votes. So this program is making Celtic more democratic. And a byproduct of that is making the board more uh, more responsible to the, or having to react to the views of the fans. Because it's the fans that really own the club, not the shareholders. Without the fan club, nothing. No, you're right. And I think there there has been a real disconnect uh, this season, David. We started off looking forward, looking towards a, a possible quadruple treble. We're looking ahead to 10 in a row. We're football fans. That's what we do. We're looking at what's happening on the football park. We're excited about new signings coming in. The season very quickly turned into a bit of a nightmare. And um, before you know it, there's barriers up outside Celtic Park, the stadium that the fans invested in, you know, their, their hard-earned cash and shares, as you say, all those years ago. Um, so how disappointed have you been with the club's reaction to, to fan protests so far this season? Well, the first thing, a, well, I, I am disappointed. Celtic Trust is disappointed. And I think a majority of fans are disappointed. I think there's some Celtic directors that don't know their history. They're only getting to sit in those comfy seats because of Celts for Change protests that took place in the 1990s. And they should remember that when they start criticising fans. They're only, we only are where we are. We've only won nine because of the action of fans uh, in Celts for Change and wider. And you have to tell you, Celts for Change uh, back to criticism uh, back in the day. But without fans standing up and making a noise, you don't get the board's attention. Uh, so it has to be done, but it has to be done in an orderly manner. You cannot condone this really disruptive and unruly behaviour or breaking the law. That's not on. So uh, you have a right to demonstrate. You have a right to protest. And uh, you know that's what fans want to do, but they have to do it in a responsible manner. Mm -hmm. 
The way that I support Celtic, David, is uh, from uh, an area outside Glasgow. I've been a member of Celtic supporters clubs in the past. I've travelled through myself or with a small group of friends in a vehicle. But I've never been involved in an association or an affiliation or indeed up to uh, fairly recently. I didn't know that much about the Celtic Trust. And I think what happens is when there's a a crisis, if you want to call it a crisis or a collapse, uh, unexpected or otherwise, uh, fans do look around to see where is our voice, where is the fans' voice. Uh, You're waiting perhaps for some kind of comment from an association uh, which, to my knowledge, hasn't been forthcoming. But what I have been impressed with is that the Celtic Trust seem to have come to the fore, David. So how have you reacted to the current situation? And obviously, you're now organising a movement on Sunday, which is going to be COVID compliant, so that uh, we can still put that message across. Well, you're right in a number of fronts there. The Celtic Trust has been around since, uh, say, 2000. Uh, I only got involved uh, roughly a year ago. Uh, to get uh, involved with the share thing that I was talking about, which is sort of my area of knowledge, if you like. Uh, but you're also right that when a, a football club's doing well, uh, there's not really much interest in thing, you know, like if parallel organisations or something like the trust, because you, you're happy your team's winning. <laughs> really, really good. But because this collapse, and it was allowing me, for example, to go on with this and the others to, to get involved in reactivating these shares below the radar, uh, and that's the way I like it most of the time. But the, the collapse in the team has changed the whole dynamic. Suddenly, supporters are looking for an alternative voice or an alternative view, uh, and the trust is there. So our membership you know, has exploded. Uh, our cash flow has exploded. Uh, we're using uh, funds raised to uh, buy shares, which in turn is buying ownership, which is in turn buying influence. And the idea is to basically get that uh, percentage shareholding up as high as, as high as we can. So uh, that remains a core principle uh, of uh, the, the Celtic Trust. Uh, it is an industrial and provident society. It's owned by its members, not a small group of people. There is no share capital, and uh, there is an asset lock agreement whereby if it was to be wound up, uh, any assets in uh, the Celtic Trust would be distributed to Celtic charities. So it's also regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, so it's a pretty pucker responsible and growing uh, organisation with uh, 10 trustees that are all volunteers, nobody gets paid anything, and they get uh, elected democratically. Every year, I think uh, the next one's uh, January next year. So that piece of background is very relevant. Regarding a protest, look, it's a controversial point. Everybody's view has to be respected. And when it comes to Celtic, everybody has a view. So, you know what, there's going to be a protest on Sunday. There always was going to be one. And if there's going to be a protest, nobody can argue that having it organised, at least and stewarded in a COVID-compliant way is a bad thing. So if there's going to be a protest, it should be, it should be a controlled and stewarded protest. And you know what? If nobody turns up, that's great as well. The point is it's organised and uh, everybody behaves themselves. So I, I have no problem with there being a protest. It's called democracy. And it's protests that got the board into the position we're just now. That Absolutely. should always be remembered. I re-emphasize that point. So nobody should be can complaining. I just, can I just jump in there? Um, yeah. Uh, just a, a point to make. A couple of points to make. Um, first of all, on a personal level, I have a bit of discomfort with the current climate in terms of COVID and things with the protests. But I also am conflicted with the point of I'm of an age where. To be perfectly honest, I wouldn't remember Celtic Football Club without the protests before. I, I, I was born in the late 1980s and and if there were no protests in the early 90s, I wouldn't be sitting here now discussing a club that's given me 30 years worth of memories. So while I'm divided, I can appreciate it from both sides. And just a general question about um, going back to, you know, we all throw around this phrase about people being Celtic-minded and whether the board is Celtic-minded, whether the manager is Celtic-minded. Do you think as as supporters, as a group, that we expect too much of that? Do we over-romanticise it because of the way we feel about the club? Or do you think there should be 
more of a personal connection on top of the sort of financial and business connections that these people have? No, I think there is a detachment with the board. I think the board are, are not in tune with the, the mood of most Celtic supporters. As a personal view, others may disagree, but nobody really cares about these things when you're winning trebles and quadruple trebles, God willing, later this month. Uh, we're only having this type of conversation uh, because of uh, the, the collapse in the team, and there's still hope that you know that that will change. But yeah, I think there is a, a disconnect uh, at the moment. It's not nearly as bad as it was in the 1990s. You know, Celtic is very well run. I mean, let's not for, for, forget that uh, in a way that, for example, you, you know, previous Rangers weren't, uh, current Rangers aren't either. either. But at the end of the day, we're a football club. People don't support, fans don't support well-run companies. They support you know, winning football teams. And I think the balance between finance and football is maybe out of sync just now. There's been a, also been a, co- a coincidence of uh, uh, a, a misalignment of the stars. Of like, negatives have all come to pass at the same time. I mean, it is a matter of fact, you know, there's quite a lot of players in that squad that would rather not be there. I think that some of them are seduced by the spectre of uh, much more money in, in England. Uh, you know, some people say, well, that's always been the case, uh, but not to the extent that it appears just now. I mean, we've got half a dozen Morelises in the team, as far as I can see, you know, that are going at half speed. And if it takes kids and youngsters to come in like last night to get results, you know, so be it. Anyone that doesn't want to play for Celtic, you know, shouldn't be playing for Celtic. And uh, maybe they've been cut too much slack. I don't know. That's a personal opinion. But uh, your question is disconnect. I think there is a disconnect. I think the board is a bit stale. Uh, you know, non-executive directors have been there for yonks, nine years. Uh, you know, that's unusual. Uh, it's not the best corporate governance. Uh, I can't tell you there was no meetings of the nominations committee. You know, it's all a bit comfortable, all all a bit easy street. And I think it's uh, taken something uh, like this to really... Uh, I'm hoping it will uh, recharge everybody's batteries, reinvigorate the club, and, you know, we'll get some changes for the better. Mm. Because ultimately, uh, you know, we can still win a quadruple treble, we can still win the league. And uh, there's pure tr- trophies to concentrate on if you, if you want to look at it that way. No, you're right. I think that will come into it, David, actually, as uh, we fail to progress in Europe and our biggest challengers obviously have progressed. Uh, also in the League Cup, so they're going to play a lot more games. But see, when we're looking at change and you're saying that, um, and I do believe that this will result in change, when we're looking at the, the CEO um, now, to go back on one of the points you made, the club is very well run, absolutely. But normally when you're looking at a CEO and you're looking at him entering his or uh, going into his 18th year at the helm, do you think there comes a time where, where that change would be good for the club as well? Well, that's, that's, that's a, a controversial point. I think if you're looking at the financial aspect of the club, I think it's uh, very well, well run. You basically get two types of directors. You've got executive directors, of which there's two. You know, there's the chief executive and finance director. And I don't really think you could argue too much that uh, they've done a good job in terms of finance. It's there in the balance sheet. It's there in the cash. It doesn't really matter how long they've been there, quite frankly, even from a financial perspective. That's my personal view. But then you have the non-executive directors, you know, of which there's four or five, I can never remember exactly how much. And they're supposed to give, guess what, an independent view of things. Mm. They're supposed to question the executive. Uh, and there's various different committees that afford them to do that. That is an audit committee, a remuneration committee, and, and a nominations committee uh, populated by the non-executive directors. And that's what I'm saying. The nominations committee didn't last last month so last year sorry so there are you know there's a uh, there looks from the outside that it's all very comfortable jobs for the boys almost mm-hmm. and uh, I would question the contribution that uh, some of the non-executive directors uh, make it's their job to question the board it should really the supporters you know shouldn't really have to uh, do that so you've got to look at them a uh, 
I'm not a big fan of the chairman either. Uh, you know, that's just a personal view. I think we need uh, competing voices in that boardroom. Maybe, maybe they do compete, and we don't know. But they're not making a good attempt at articulating these things. They're not communicating. That was uh, that was the original question. And I think there is a remoteness and an aloofness. Maybe that will change. Maybe this whole collapse is going to recalibrate everybody and we're all going to try and do better as fans, as shareholders, as board members. Uh, we all want to develop a positive attitude because there's still a leak to win. It's not lost yet. That's my view anyway. No, well, I think there were, there were some um, positives certainly last night, David, and I hope that you know, results in those changes being maintained on Sunday. Some of the players that came in last night, um, you you know, put a smile on our face, like you say, David, for the first time in a while. Uh, one of the things that really interested me the last time we spoke was your incredible tale about Wimbledon FC and obviously Clyde Bank and how Celtic had aspirations to play their football elsewhere. And it was interesting that Dermot Desmond came out fairly recently to say that, you know, uh, they're no longer around the table talking about this Atlantic, transatlantic league. What was your thoughts on that? Do you think there's something else in the mix? Do they have something else in the distance that they've got their eye on? I would speculate yes is the answer to that. COVID has thrown everything up in the air. Uh, The way league structures are all up for renegotiation, there's a lot of money flying about from private equity, you know, uh, geo-blocking of television contracts is going to get challenged. Everything's getting streamed now. Uh, I, I think anything goes, and I think there's going to be enormous change uh, in league structures and the way the games are broadcast. And I don't think anybody would want to commit to any league prematurely, be it an Atlantic League or any other league. So nobody knows what the situation is going to be like when, when COVID finally passes. But I definitely anticipate change. And at the end of the day, to use business speak, Celtic is you know, a global brand name. Uh, it's the biggest club in Scotland. It's a big fish in a small pond. And it's always been the ambition of the Celtic board, certainly since the 1990s, to, to uh, get into a larger jurisdiction get its hands on bigger broadcast monies in order to have a a bigger football budget. So Celtic's been bumping against that glass ceiling for like 10, 20 years, and there's been periodic talk about this league and that, joining the British League, joining an Atlantic League, and it's been very difficult because of league structures and the way that they're built. They're built to maintain the status quo. But with COVID, anything goes. So Celtic... uh, board uh, has been pretty stable. That's that's the other flip side of the coin. Peter Lawwell has been there for a while. Celtic have gravitas uh, in the higher echelons of of, of UFA. Uh, they're on, uh, Peter and I think uh, the finance director might be on the board of a, you know, the European Club Association. You know, our views are respected. But, uh, and that's something to be appreciated, but uh, at the end of the day, we're in the business of winning football games, and that's what's making everybody agitated, me agitated. And right here, right now, uh, the spectre of not winning that 10 is, is like freaking everybody out, quite frankly. So no, it is, it's all very it's, emotional, as they say. It's looming, it is looming, um, David, but uh, ever the optimist, I agree with you, I don't think it's over yet, certainly not. Now, um, when we're talking about the trust accumulating some shares themselves and building up uh, an influence, we've also spoken about a disconnect between the fans and the club. Do you see the trust as a conduit to that? Could we be in a situation where we have a stronger voice due to the accumulation of these shares via the trust? Yes, uh, I mean, and uh, the reason why I say yes, and the reason why I mentioned it earlier, you know, the trust is a uh, properly and formally constituted body, you know, regulated or registered rather with the FCA. So it, it, it's w- with a constitution. So it's it's real and it's tangible, and it encompasses a whole lot of different views on its on its board, and no doubt on its membership. And I'll make passing reference to this open forum or open meeting that we had in Zoom at the weekend. It was like one giant celebrity squares, you know, boxes everywhere. And it was all, all different ages, different sexes, uh, etc. And I tell you what, a whole lot of different views. 
there weren't too many positive views in the air, you know, because of the re results, but there was a whole lot of different views. And I think that was a good representative proxy of the Celtic support. Just everybody is emotional and everybody's got an exaggerated view on what should be done, who's to blame. That's another thing about it is all, all blame culture people. You know, it's always got to be somebody's fault. Uh, blame's not a word I like. I, I just think uh, we're a victim of circumstance to a serious extent. And certainly the board could have, could have done better. And the management team could de definitely have done better. And uh, the players absolutely could have done better. And depending on what your view is, you know, they're all to blame to some extent. Again, I had a, a mini poll, I got roughly 5,000 responses just as a just to get a flavour to see whether I'd got it wrong. And 47% thought it was the managers. To, and it was mostly to blame, because nobody's totally to blame. Who was mostly to blame? The manager, 47% thought, thought, it, thought it was Neil. Uh, and then the rest was split between the board and, uh, and uh, the players. Mm -hmm. So we're all to blame. We're, we're all been a bit complacent. But at the end of the day, you know, the the manager, no manager can survive, you know, bad results, whether it's fair or not, irrespective of circumstances or not. So unless Lenny, you know, pulls it round, uh, you know, he, he his position is precarious, and I think nobody will be more aware of that than him. Yeah. I mean, I, I have been critical of Neil Lennon as much as I love him and love him as a player. Um, but I take on board, David, that there has been issues around the recruitment, um, Deep-rooted issues around recruitment for a number of years, actually, at Celtic. Uh, there's the want away stars. There seems to be some issues around uh, the coaching staff. What I'm going to ask you, and again, it's your opinion, do you think Lenny has what it takes to turn this round? He's, he's, in, in my opinion, he's definitely got what it takes to turn it around. Whether he's allowed that time is another matter. Uh, and whether the players play is another matter. Uh, you, you know, you can have a whole podcast on as one subject and uh, we'll probably never uh, get a definitive answer. But I, I think uh, the next few, two or three games will be the decisive ones. We're into January and there's a break in Dubai. Uh, all the mood music coming at Celtic Park is uh, no change is imminent. Uh, all I know is that we've got a game on Sunday, Neil Lennon's the manager. and uh, I hope he puts that team on the park that was playing last night, quite frankly. And I think you should make an example of uh, one or two players. If you don't want to play here, well, go and play in Kelvin Grove Park on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so we'll see what happens on Sunday. No, great. Now, David, it's always a pleasure to chat, and I'm pretty sure there'll be further developments throughout the season. You're always welcome to come on and join us. So thank you very much once again for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. Thank you. Laura. Yes. You are making your debut on a Celtic State of Mind. David Lowe, David Lowe has been on the, the show probably about six times. So uh, welcome. Welcome to the show. Now, uh, David always offers a, a fascinating insight into the financials of Celtic Football Club, having been, mm -hmm. you know, a, an advisor to Fergus McCann. And we all know what Fergus done back in the, the actually back in the late 80s to early 90s, because it took a long, long time for him to, to actually get to where he, where he wanted to be. Um, but before we talk about the, the current issues, let's have a wee chat about last night. Let's bask in the glory of a fairly <laughs> decent performance where there were quite a few points positives to take from last night what's your what's your own takes from uh, the victory against Lille the the first thing that springs to mind is just the word energy I can't remember the last time I watched a game where I saw so much energy from pretty much the entire team you, you were you were watching a, a team who looked as if they were actually interested in winning the game for the sake of winning the game you know there's so much placed on other other fixtures we've had where is this going to keep us in this cup? Is this going to keep us uh, in touch with Rangers? Is this going to keep us in the Europa League? Last night there was none of that and yet we still had a team who looked like they just wanted to win the game and that mm -hmm. was the biggest sort of takeaway that I had from it because I don't feel like I've seen that from a Celtic team for probably months at this point. Mm -hmm. It was all getting a bit stale. You know, yeah. and when when you're watching it, Laura, you're thinking, well, 
Lenny's trying to change the shape. He's trying to change the personnel. Um, but obviously not enough because I did see there's loads of comments coming in today as there always is and it's brilliant that people are able to get involved via YouTube, Twitter and Facebook and we'll be having a look at some of these comments as we go through the show. But um, quite a lot of them, I've got to say, were shouting for Sorrow and Turnbull. And whilst uh, I agreed with the Turnbull one, Laura, because we'd seen plenty of them at Motherwell and, and in glimpses in a Celtic jersey, I yeah. hadn't seen enough of Sorrow, I've got to be honest. I mean, I'd seen as much as everybody else, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so I wasn't I wasn't sold on that idea. And then before the game last night, I'm saying to Kevin Graham, you know, it always concerns me when we throw a team together like that, rather than introducing a couple of guys, maybe against Hamilton in the first day of the season, um, or against Motherwell when we're 4-1 up. We just seem to throw it all together. And it didn't look as though it was planned. You know, it wasn't by design. But lo and behold, it worked. It actually worked. And, you know, talking about this transition from front to back, where we're on the attack, but uh, all, for example, all Hibs had to do was play a long ball and we were done Ferenc mm-hmm. Farrell's done it to us Ross County done it to us St Johnston teams know how to play against Celtic and we were getting that wrong for the best part of the season all of a sudden that changed yesterday and it, it was down to the midfield it was down to Sorrow playing in that holding role which he done so effectively McGregor seems to have got a wee bit of stick on social media this morning um, I think he will if we continue to play McGregor he'll play back into form I think it was the wrong choice to drop him in the cup game against Ross County I didn't understand that um, and then Turnbull gave us this creativity I mean his dead balls were brilliant so yeah. do you think the key issue right now is uh, I do have a wee concern that Lenny will revert to type on Sunday what do you reckon yeah. he'll do on Sunday what do you think he should do on Sunday well I mean Part of me wants to say just put the same team out. You know, they've come off the back of a, a really good win against, let's not forget, a very good side. You know, some people slag off the French League. I have watched a bit of it over the years. And OK, Paris Saint-Germain have so much more resources than everybody else. But, you know, the teams that are up towards the top of that league, the way Lille must be to get into the Europa League, are not by any means poor football teams. So we have to take on board that we've beaten a very good team but as far as Sunday's concerned I think there are certain players who I think for example just to pick one out if Ryan Christie's not watching that and thinking I need to do more if he's not watching Turnbull's performance and thinking I need to do more then then there's a serious issue there mm-hmm. um, I, I think Klamala did well um probably wasn't getting the right kind of service, but looked like he was trying. I wouldn't be particularly against Edward coming back in uh, in his place, just because, you know, if we are playing as well as we did last night, we know that Eddie's got the quality to to put the ball in the back of the net. But uh, apart from that, I, I don't know that I would change the the rest of the team very much. The big revelation for me was Chris, uh, Christopher Ayer at, at right back. I mean, you just... I don't know if it was... It just looked out of place to me because I, I've watched him play at centre back so much. But he seemed to be able to make these kind of striding runs quite yeah. a lot, and 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 had a lot more mobility than I think I've given him credit for in the past. And I just thought, if it works, you know, why change it? I would say, when was the last time we had a right back play that well? El Hamid definitely did in his early days, but as we've talked about earlier on the pod this week, there's other issues there, so he's not going to really be an option. Um, but but yeah, I, I, for the most part, I would say um, I would say don't change it. McGregor again, I agree with you. I think he would come into his own. I think he's bearing a little bit too much responsibility for for Scott Brown's shortcomings at the moment. In terms of Scott Brown's been a great servant. He's he's he had a bit of a, a boost, I think, when Brendan Rodgers came in in, ca- in case of his fitness and things. But at the end of the day, he's thirty five now. He isn't going to be able to play week in week out. And I think to replace him more regularly with somebody like Sorrow could free up McGregor a bit more and get him back to being the kind of old player that we remember him from from back in the sort of Ronnie Dyla days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there's not a lot to disagree with there, I, I've got to say, Laura. I think when I was looking at uh, Ayer, again, one of our very own Lawrence Conley was um, going on and on and on about Ayer being a right back. Um, and I honestly didn't think that was an option. I really didn't. And I'm thinking back to a couple of occasions that he's played there. 
Uh, mm. And, you know, I think he was impressive a couple of times, but then there was a few occasions I thought, right, you know, it's okay adapting a, a midfielder and bringing him back. And, you know, he, he's he's able to play like an old style sweeper and he, he's got these galloping runs, uh, which can turn defence into attack. And that was fantastic. But last night I was surprised at how well he performed uh, on the right-hand side. And I posted a team on Twitter this morning where Ayer would be playing right back for me uh, come Sunday. Yep. Um, he showed some signs of it, I think, when he, he went on one of his runs. Him and El Hamid linked up well against St. Johnson for mm-hmm. Griff- Griffiths' goal, the opening goal at McDermott Park. Um, so, yeah, I'd agree with that. That was a bit of a revelation. My big concern, of course, is if you do that, then you're taking a strong centre-half out of the centre of the, the defence and you're replacing them with Duffy. Now, yeah. I, I watched his performance as well, Laura, last night with interest because... I mean, the thing with Duffy is we all want want him to do well. It's just that it's been an absolute nightmare for him since he's come in. And I was watching him, and I, I did see a lot, a lot of occasions where where you know he's basically trying to header everything. Um, he takes his eye off the ball. He closes his eyes going for headers. He handballs yeah. it. He sometimes pushes and climbs and all this kind of stuff. He's a bit cumbersome, but. You know, arguably that was his best game in a Celtic jersey. And I think a big part of that, and by the way, I'm not sold on Duffy in case everybody thinks mm-hmm. that uh, Rose tinted spectacles. I'm certainly not sold on him. But what are the options? Because as you mentioned, El Hamid, it seems as though we're just counting down the days until he moves back to Israel, which is a shame because I think we had a real player in him. But he has shown his deficiencies a few times this season. Or Beaton, uh, yet again, another adapted midfielder back into the centre of defence. He's, he's a bit too cool for my liking at times. Um, he can become lax and because of that he can lose the ball. But we've seen some excellent performances from Beaton in there as well. So I think there's a big question there. Does he put Ayer at right back? And if so, he's got an even bigger decision to make with who he partners with, Julian. Should Beaton be fit? Does he come back in? Or do you try and get some more games and confidence in Duffy? What, what was your thoughts on Duffy last night? I mean, I, I think he's probably the only player on the park that... I, I personally wouldn't have given passing marks to. I think um, I keep thinking back to, I don't know if you saw on Twitter um, a a few weeks ago, I can't remember what game it was, but there was a a still photo of him uh, with a ball coming through over the top and he was just running in the completely opposite direction, not even looking at the ball. It wasn't even particularly obvious from the photo where he was going or what he was trying to do. And I think he definitely still shows evidence of that in terms of, you know, just quite often making decisions that, that you're a bit like, I don't know what the what the thinking was behind that. For example, the, the Lille goal last night, okay, uh, McGregor, you know, made a pass back that I think was poorly judged. He wasn't looking, he didn't put yeah. enough power into it. He basically laid it on a plate for the Lille forward. I thought that Duffy made the wrong decision in not trying to come and then close that down. Um, he kind of seemed to hesitate and then didn't have time to do anything about it and backed off, gave the guy too much space and led to the goal. So it's his decision making that I feel is is a little bit suspect, which for a guy's age who's been an international is surprising. But on the other side of it, I think you have to give him a bit more time and see if he can settle with a partner like Julian. We all know that Julian's got quality from what we saw last season. Hopefully, if they could build a relationship, that would be something that could hopefully um, blossom going forward. Uh, You know, we're not even get the pressure of him having to come up against, you know, higher quality opposition in Europe. So maybe with all due respect to the rest of Scottish football, he'll have an opportunity to get some games under his belt against some lesser opposition and build that confidence with Julian at the back and and maybe make a partnership that will be positive going forward. Mm. It's disappointing, really. I mean, I've mentioned the recruitment time and time again, uh, and I know Neil Lennon plays a massive part in it, but he's not the sole voice when it comes to who comes in. Uh, and we know at Celtic, uh, we use this Fed uh, example, and we only know about it because Brennan Rogers let the cat out of the bag when he was being interviewed that time, where it was quite clear he had no part to play in Celtic signing the player for a couple of million quid. Um, you know, which when you accumulate so many players at a couple of million pounds, um, it's unbelievable how much money we've wasted. Yeah. But um, when we're looking at the recruitment, it's it's disappointing, it really is, that we're at this stage of the season, we're struggling for a right back and we're struggling for any kind of players out wide, right or left. 
And that's happened after just a couple of injuries. I mean, the El Hamid thing is a slightly different situation. Uh, we've lost him through COVID issues this season, through injury. But obviously there's been other personal issues mm-hmm. happening and that will ultimately end his Celtic career by the sounds of it. Jamesy Forrest gets injured. And then we've got a real issue on the right-hand side. Mikey Johnson's not back yet, but we didn't have anybody to put in his place anyway. It seems as though that's bad squad management. Uh, Neil Lennon obviously has to take some responsibility for it. But I take into account that others do as well. And there's a herd of recruitment there. We've got to continue to look at the squad and improve on it. Um, Now, we're looking at some of the comments coming in, Laura. And um, Davy Boyle Boy commenting on Twitter says that keep that team for Sunday and we can bring back the belief and make 10 a reality. I mean, I've got to say, leading up to last night, two wins in 12, people were reminding us that it's going to be the worst home record since 46-47 when we were fighting relegation, believe it or not, that season. Um, And you're thinking, wow, we really have, we've truly thrown this away. All the hard work of the last decade and we're throwing it away um, and it doesn't help that the, the biggest challengers, the team that are leading at the top of the league, are they seem to be like a juggernaut. Um, but again, I'm not getting carried away with that, Laura, because I do believe that there will come a point this season where we need to capitalise. And the issue has been, we've not capitalised, we've not stayed within touching distance of them, and we need to keep our own backyard in order. Last night gave us some belief that that might happen. Do you think that um, with a proper and, and better use of his squad, Sorrow and Turnbull being prime examples, I mean, Hazard was, was for me an absolute bonus last night because we're struggling. We really are struggling. And what I've seen from Hazard was someone who was actually commanding his area. I mean, yeah. he was, he was speaking to the two centre-halves, Laura. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there you've got two guys there who, I mean, obviously under 20 level, Julian was an international, but you've got a guy who's captain the Republic of Ireland, 28 years of age. And I just felt that Hazard really was a standout in the respect. I know he lost a couple of goals, but the fact that, he, you know, he really did demand that area. And that, I think that's been missing this season. We had Big yeah. Foster, but he's been replaced with someone who isn't in the same league as him. I mean, Hazard, does he deserve the gloves on Sunday as well? I mean, I I see no reason why not. I, I know he conceded two goals, but I mean, the goals that he conceded were were goals that any goalkeeper would have conceded, I think. And and I, like you say, it was actually something I did notice a couple of times. There was one save where he had to make, I think, a save with his right leg and he was straight up on his feet, you know, mm. shouting down the defenders and saying, you know, what are you doing? Giving him that space and that time. So... I think he's obviously got the confidence. I think at this point, is he going to be any worse than Barkas or Bain? I don't think so. Certainly not based on the one performance that we've seen so far. I I, I wouldn't feel like he was a risk to keep in there, put it that way. If, if you're going to talk about whether somebody's a risk, he's not one that I would consider to be one. So I, I, would, I would say put him in place. But at the wider point that I'm a bit, a bit concerned about is... <sighs> It's actually, although I'm riding a high from the win, it's making me question Neil Lennon's decisions even more because you can't you can't tell me that Sorrow's not been putting in displays in training that would have warranted a, a game if he goes on to perform to that level when he gets put in. He must yeah. have been showing that in training. So Turnbull the same, you know. So what have they been watching? What have they been deciding that? that they've not had the chance. I appreciate Turnbull's had his issues with COVID, but Sorrow certainly, I mean, it baffles me that he can come in. There's no way he came in and put that that performance in having shown absolutely nothing in training before that. So so judgment is an issue for me. No, you're spot on. It actually ties in with one of the points that's coming through. Uh, just to let everybody know who is commenting, uh, whilst we're chatting and I'm concentrating on either David or Laura, I'm not directly looking at the comments, but I then start looking through them. So if there's any of an inappropriate nature, and you know what I'm talking about, I will get round to them. If not during the live chat, then after the event, and we will weed them out. Uh, I don't want them to ruin the experience of anybody that comes into the, the Axon Bulletin. But Laura, going back to your point there, I, I totally agree with that because when you're looking, and again, I'm, I actually have a theory on it, um, but before I, I share that with you, Mark Jennings says, last night changes nothing. We need a top-class coach. Lenny won't improve Sorrow, Turnbull and Frimpong. Now, I've said in the past that I don't think Lenny is in the business of developing players. I really don't. I think he's a manager who has a certain style whereby if someone's not doing it for him, he'll buy someone to replace that person. So, 
I, I've always said that. That's not just flippant or a knee jerk. That that's how I think Lennon actually manages. I don't think he's a development coach. He does. I mean, yeah, he introduced James Forrest to the side and has played a part in James Forrest's development. But very very few other young players. Um, probably are under that bracket. I mean, someone might say Frimpong. Yeah, he introduced Frimpong. Um, has Frimpong improved under Neil Lennon? That's another question. But I'm looking at last season. Let's go back to last season where we're going to a very important Champions League qualifier and we've got 10 million quid of brand new purchases sitting on the bench. And at that time, Bolingoli was apparently going to be our left back and we had Julien. You remember Julien sitting on the bench. At that point, one of our, our biggest signings of all time at £7 million. Now, £10 million on the bench, Callum McGregor at left back, we bounce out of Europe. Why didn't he play them? It wasn't a fitness issue, so why didn't he play them? And then the question you've raised, why hasn't he played Turnbull? Why hasn't he played Sorrow? Does this go back to the recruitment issue? Are they players that Neil Lennon actually wanted at the club? Is that why there's been a reluctance to put them in as soon as they were available, as soon as they were fit enough? Because the issue you then have, if you don't play a player like Turnbull, is that by 83 minutes, he's absolutely knackered. The first time he lost the ball was due to fatigue. You could see it. Um, he had been outstanding, I've got to say, outstanding. I mean... If anyone deserved a winning goal last night, Laura, it was it was Turnbull. I don't yeah. think Sorrow was ever going to be that far up the pitch uh, because he was he was a close second behind him. But again, that comes down to bad squad management. So Turnbull should be able to to play ninety minutes. Sorrow should be able to play ninety minutes. It comes up with cramp. So these guys were suffering due to the fact that they've not had a lot of games, and then they're thrown in against an excellent side, like you mm-hmm. said before, Leo. And AC Milan, the two best sides we've played all year, without a shadow of a doubt. And I'm not taking any credit away from anyone else who's beaten us this season. Um, maybe apart from one side, who I don't want to give too much credit to. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Turnbull and Sorrow, as you say, they've surely shown it. They've surely shown it day in, day out. And I just wonder, is there a reluctance by Neil Lennon due to the fact that they're not his players, even though he's the manager and they're coming in under his watch? Um, Sorrow, obviously, you know, came in last January. We've barely seen him. But what I saw last mm-hmm. night, I thought we've been crying out for this guy for weeks. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's been a, a trait of Neil Lennon's management style uh, during his first spell and his second spell. He, he certainly has favourites. I think all managers do. But to, to be in a position where those favourites end up staying in the team regardless of performance and at the expense of other players who must be shown that they're worth a, a go is, you know, we hear people talk about Neil Lennon being a Celtic man and, and this and that. If he was thinking in the best interests of the club, he wouldn't be thinking about only fielding his favourite players. He would be thinking about fielding the best team. Sorrow would be part of arguably the best team that we can play at the moment. Mm. And if he's not been fielded, I can only assume it's for some other reason, such as that he maybe didn't want to drop Scott Brown, even though his performances weren't living up to expectation, or um, or, he, or his judgment in viewing the players in training is just not up to scratch. But even then, you've got to ask, well, what's John Kennedy doing? What's he, what's he watching? Why is he not saying he deserves a go or he, he's not playing great? You know, the, Lennon takes a lot of the flack, as he should as manager, but there's a coaching team there for a reason. They they should also be highlighting issues with players during matches and also mm-hmm. highlighting um, the good performances of players in training. Otherwise, you know, what's the point in anybody being there doing that job? No, I think uh, I, I've been pretty critical of Kennedy, I've got to say. Um, but And I think Strachan comes into that category as well. So is Neil Lennon a, a training ground manager? You hear that all the time, uh, Laura, you know, Brian Clough very rarely was on a training ground. Martin O'Neill was the same. Loads of managers manage, you know, they don't coach. And uh, obviously that's why you've got your assistant, you've got your coach. Uh, I mean, famously, Martin O'Neill wouldn't be on the training pitch all week. He would maybe mm-hmm. then start coming onto the training pitch near the end of the week. Um, and by that time, Walford and Robertson had all done done the work. So you're right. Who isn't identifying that talent? 
I mean, it takes me back to a story I did here when I was doing a wee bit of research once and I spoke to an ex-Celtic player called John Taggart uh, back in the 1960s. I never spoke to him in the 1960s. Um, he was a player in the 1960s. And what happened was Celtic at that time used to play a lot of the reserve games at Broomfield, the mm-hmm. old park of Adrianians. And um, he's sitting in the dugout. And on this particular day, Jock Steen comes to the game. Sean Fallon used to look after the reserves. So Steen's sitting in the dugout with Sean Fallon. And uh, Jock's team was very impressed with a, a, a specific player who was playing for Celtic that night. And he turned down to Sean Fallon 75 minutes in and says, you know what, Sean? He's better than you think he is. And on the Saturday, Davy Hay was in the Celtic side. So it just shows you, Laura, you know, you've got to identify, if you're the coach or you're the assistant, you've got to identify it and report it back to Lenny. I, I guess we're giving Lenny a lot of credit here, saying, you know, he's he's not responsible. Ultimately, he is responsible. Uh, but it just beggars belief that two guys who were completely standouts last night haven't had really a sniff all season. Uh, and, you know, the big thing for me on Sunday is when we see the team lines coming through, and it's sometimes a, you know, a guessing match to see how we're going to shape up when a team line comes out is yeah. that Sorrow and Turnbull at least will start that game. I think that is, that is pivotal because otherwise it's almost as if we made that wee bit of progress and it's another couple of steps to the side or backwards. We can't mm-hmm. afford to lose another point in the league. You know, Between now and going into the game at Ibrox, you, you need a 100% uh, record, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, We keep going on about the two games in hand. Laura, you then say, well, you've got to go out and do something yourself. You've got to affect that game at Ibrox. Uh, and of course, in between times, we have what could be a quadruple treble uh, on the twentieth of December. Now, this is all seem this all seems to have happened at the right time. So you've got the group of players who were playing, but not performing to their full capacity, and then a group of players who comes in last night and play particularly well, and we get an excellent result. That's a perfect situation for Neil Lennon going into Sunday with the Scottish Cup final in mind. How many of these players do you think? will be playing against Hearts. It's it's difficult to to really predict that without seeing what the selection is on Sunday and, and how those players play. But I mean, if if the players who put in good performances last night, like Ayer, like Sorrow, like Turnbull, um, like uh Julian, like Hazard, if they if they get another chance on Sunday and don't put a foot wrong, I don't see any reason why they need to come out the team at all. It's really, there's a couple of other places up for grabs, like Elia Nussi didn't do anything wrong last night, wasn't particularly outstanding. I think Klamala didn't get the service he needed, but didn't go on to stake his claim either, so the, the strikers rose up for grabs. Um, I, I Basically, I think if the team that was out last night was put out on Sunday and didn't put a foot wrong, I wouldn't really be changing very much because let's be honest, there's nobody who wasn't playing last night who really, you know, can be banging on the manager's door this week saying, I deserve a shot. Well, you've had a shot for how many weeks and we've got two wins out of 12. So, you know, I would go with the players who are showing the enthusiasm. That that was another thing I was going to say, actually. Ewan Henderson last night, mm. um, he was... I get that he he's still got a lot of learning to do. He's a young guy. He, he he sometimes appears to run around a bit like a headless chicken. But I was just so enthused to see a player who just looked like it meant everything to him to be playing. And I thought, and I I do believe like we can't over romanticise it based on the question I said earlier. We can't we can't expect every player who signs for our club to care about our club the way that we do. But to see a bit of that ambition, a bit of that passion, just to be proud to be playing for the club and proud to be getting your opportunity, it must show some of the other players who just have have maybe been playing for too long and think it's a bit just kind of the right rather than an opportunity that, you know, there's something to be proud of playing for the first team and, and you should be proud of it and you should try your hardest every week because if you don't, somebody's going to be there to, to take your place. Mm-hmm. Listen, Laura, I think um, when, when we're talking about the, the Scottish Cup final, if you had asked me a month ago and uh, 
you know, the names of Hazard or, or Henderson, who I don't expect to start on Sunday, but I agree with you. I thought he was very impressive. Uh, showed some really good signs. Um, or Sorrow or Turnbull, would I have expected them to be, you know, in the running for a starting berth in the Scottish Cup final? Absolutely no way. But yeah. one thing that was concerning me, and I mentioned it yesterday before the game, because I wasn't predict- predicting a Celtic win, and I certainly wasn't predicting wholesale changes in the team. But I did say that, you know, there's half a dozen players... Uh, by all accounts, half a dozen players um, who Neil Lennon was referring to after the Ferenc Varos game, who are mm-hmm. angling for move, they don't want to be at the club. Are they in, in a huff because the club didn't uh, sell them? I mean, th- they may not have had the offers, uh, you know, because we heard about interest in Eduard, we heard about interest in Ayer and in Cham, but how much real interest was in uh, Christa? I heard a rumour about Burnley being interested. So, I mean, I don't think anyone was knocking the door down to try and sign these players, actually. Mm-hmm. But yeah, at the time, like everyone else, I was delighted uh, that we kept a hold of them because it would appear at that point that that's your strongest team with those players in it. But I think that has actually been part of um, our undoing this season because you, half a dozen players, if they're all 10, 15, 20% off their best, then, you know, that that actually creates a rot in the team. Then you might have a couple of the new guys who haven't settled in Duffy and Barkas. Before you know it, you've got eight players who aren't playing well. And then the other ones are taking the burden and it might affect them. And I saw that actually with Luxol. I thought when Luxol came into the side, you know, it was a breath of fresh air. We weren't actually winning games. I know he made his debut at Celtic Park against Rangers. But, you know, you sort of thought to yourself, we've got a player there. But very quickly, within about five games, it was almost as if he levelled out to everybody else's standard. And that was a shame because I thought, and, and by the way, I thought he played pretty well last night again. But let's just keep him as a left back. I mean, you made a point there about El Yanusi. Um, and I agree. El Yanusi is all about a bit of flair. He glides by players. He's got a great shot on him. He scores goals. Um, he didn't do any of that last night yet it was a competent enough performance and you think well that's because him and Laxalt were working well together down the left hand side um, and then down the right hand side we didn't get an opportunity to see if the same could be said about Ayer and Frimpong unfortunately but you know when you're looking at those players and I made mention yesterday just don't play them now that's bold because that's six players some of whom are your best players Ayer is one of the best players Christy um, and Cham yeah, I take or leave in charm, to be honest with you, Eduard. But only Eduard if he's on fire. The Eduard we've been seeing, the 70% mm-hmm. Eduard, you know, Griffiths will run more for you. Uh, Clamalla will run a lot more for you. I don't think he's mm-hmm. as effective as any of the two. Um, but what's then happened is, and I think it's not been by design, Lennon now has three or four guys who probably wouldn't be quoted that I agree with you. Put them in instead of these guys who aren't actually giving you 100%. Yeah. Um, and, you know, going back to what I said just, I don't think they're down tools, but they're certainly not on their, their top game. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm definitely up for Sorrow, Turnbull, possibly Hazard. I don't think I'd start Henderson, but I'll tell you what, he's, he's done his, himself no um, issue what, whatsoever last night with that performance. Yeah. To be honest with you, Laura, I liked his big brother. I thought Liam Henderson was a, a fabulous young player as well. Uh, it might have been a managerial change that kind of ruined his Celtic career. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you this because although we have a, an Axom WhatsApp uh, group, which you've been a member of for some time, um, I would be interested to know, um, at the moment, one, one result doesn't make a massive change to the, the big issues that are out there. And many, many Celtic fans think that we need change. Uh, now, the immediate change, obviously, is a change on the football park. And the way that we can affect that is by changing the, the manager and coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Um, so if that was to happen, and I've heard a lot of people, Lucky15 Voodoo, uh, the latest one on YouTube, saying, who would you replace them with? And you need to be careful what you wish for. I think I, I put a comment in the WhatsApp group that you mentioned um, a, a couple of days ago. And... Taking apart last night, which was fantastic, you know, if that hadn't happened, we would still be talking about wanting them replaced quite rightly because uh, if if last night turns out to be a one-off, then then we're still in the same situation. My comment was that this argument of be careful what you wish for and, um, you know, well, we might end up making a mistake and getting somebody worse in, that's true. But would it be worse than the current situation? My argument is no. I think it's worth taking a chance to make a change to see if it works. Personally, my choice would be, and I know he's become less and less popular as time's gone on, my choice would be Eddie Howe. He's he's available. 
Um, he didn't particularly leave um, Bournemouth because of, you know, it, they weren't playing great when he left, I get that. But, I mean, you're talking about a guy who was there for seven or eight years. He probably, his message just got a bit stale at the at the club. The rise that he took them on over his time there and the football he was playing, he got them to a point where they were almost considered a kind of, you know, solid Premier League side, which for a mm. club the size of Bournemouth is quite an achievement. And I just think that although in recent years he's not been as great, I think a fresh challenge for him with a club the size of Celtic would bring out the best in him and probably allow us to play a certain brand of football that, that although not exactly similar to what Rodgers would have played, would certainly be more entertaining than, than we've seen recently and, and maybe a bit more imaginative. So he would be the standout choice for me. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't agree, but that's that's certainly where I would go. I've heard a lot of fans saying exactly the same, um, and, but I do agree with your initial point. Is you know the the risk of losing what has been built up over a decade is a, a far greater risk for me than doing nothing. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, or sorry, going out and getting a manager. And everybody has a preference. But what happens is any name that's mentioned, oh, you'll never get him or, you know, Eddie Howe, he's rotten, Davey Moyes, no chance. Uh, so it's difficult actually to, to stake a claim for just about anybody. Uh, and obviously I mentioned a few left field names uh, over the last few weeks. And, you know, <coughs> I, I mentioned Mark Hughes, Mark Bowen. Right. And you get, you get a lot of comments coming in saying no chance. He's a failure. Uh, and a lot of that's perception because in actual fact, over 20 years, if you were to look at his entire managerial career, he's not been a failure. He's only managed at the, in the top league in England or at international level. Whereas, you know, you look at uh, what Brennan Rodgers done before he came to Celtic, it wasn't spectacular, uh, you know, yet he was hailed as this elite manager. So I just think um, whoever is appointed, if indeed anyone is appointed, is going to disappoint a lot of people. Another couple of names that I've heard flying about, Jack Ross, Alex Neil. You know, it's almost as if they don't have a high enough profile. But I don't even think Celtic will be in the market for managers who are employed, Laura. So I think, you know, people like your Eddie Howe and uh, various others will certainly be uh, on the radar because yeah. you, you look at the last two managers we've, we've appointed and they've both been unemployed. So I think that's the market we'll be looking at. Um, so, yeah, it will be interesting to see how this develops, but it's a results a results business. If we go out and win against Kelly, we're then looking ahead towards the Scottish Cup final, and the thing can flip as quickly as that, can't it? Yeah, well, I, I think to, to, to bring up the point you made about the profile of the manager, that, that to me is almost irrelevant in terms of if I think that the manager, whether it's the current one or a new one coming in, plays the right kind of football, I really don't care who it is. You know, I, I've seen a lot of people saying on this pod and elsewhere that they would really love it if it was Lennon who did the 10 and, and if it was Lennon who brought brought it home. Although he's been a great servant to the club, I personally don't care who's at the helm as long as they are bringing success to the club. And I... And, even if it's a brand new manager who comes in and wins one last league title to get as the 10, you know, nobody cared about who Vim Janssen was. We just needed somebody to stop stop Rangers doing the 10, and he did. Mm-hmm. And then he won a place in Celtic fans' hearts. I, if, if Neil Lennon left now and we got in whoever, David Moyes, for example, who I know isn't a popular choice with a lot of people because he's he's not done great at his recent clubs, he wouldn't be a particularly popular or, or, or a particularly desirable choice for me either. But if David Moyes won one as the ten, I would I would be singing his name up and down the street. I really don't care about who the person is as long as they come in, they play the right type of football to win as the games and get as the title. That's that's all that I'm really bothered about. Hi, you make a great point. Talking about fashionable bosses saying, you know, Vim, Vim Janssen turns up for his first training session wearing a shell suit with a perm. I mean, yeah. he, he was anything but fashionable, but as you said, he'd done the job, didn't he? Uh, now, as well as playing Hearts on the 20th of December, uh, that weekend we've called it the quadruple treble weekend. I'm not getting carried away with myself. It's very much a hopeful uh, title. We're doing a big charity um, weekender. That's what we're doing at Celtic State of Mind. And we've managed to bring in 21 other shows, loads of Celtic podcasts, uh, St Rocks are taking an hour uh, we've got the Kano Foundation as well and we're supporting four charities uh, a massive target 
but already we're on our way. We're up at about four and a half grand at the moment. So if you do see the the link, not the ticker tape, but the link uh, underneath your video, and you've uh, you're able to to throw a couple of pound our way, then that would be fantastic. Um, if you've enjoyed any of the shows over the year, and you think, yeah, let's support you guys. We're not asking for your money. Give it to charity. So that's what we're hoping to do. It's a 24 hour broadcast split into 12, Laura, so that I might get some time in between uh, yep. to re- regain my composure. Uh, <laughs> but I'm really, really looking forward to it. And um, we're getting some fantastic videos coming through, actually. Wishing us all the best. So I'll post a couple of them on Twitter uh, over this afternoon as well. Now, in terms of a debuts, I think that was Connor Hazard's debut last night. Very impressive. Um, and you yourself are making your Axwom debut, Laura. So thank you very much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you. I'm hoping, uh, I, I want, I had in my mind it was going to be a David Marshall at the New Camp kind of debut. I think it more turned out a Henry Larson Easter Road kind of <laughs> debut. But hopefully if I can go on and emulate Henrik, that Henrik then we're doing well. <laughs> oh, you certainly will be, yeah. And by the way, he wasn't a bad player, was he? No. <laughs> Thanks everybody for getting in touch and uh, we'll be back for the game on Sunday and we'll speak to you then. 